uh, glad that. It just did not give me the option to record to the cloud. So let's hope it's doing that. Okay, it does say it's recording, so. And there you guys go. All Dr. right. Dr. Shabazz is coming on, coming in. Perfect. So it is 6.15, it's actually 6.17. Um, we have a quorum and so we will begin. Um, welcome to the African Heritage Reparation Assembly meeting for Wednesday, October 13th, 2021. Um, the virtual meeting statement for this is that pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. Please see instructions below. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. Um, I have two announcements. Um, one is that uh, we asked um, uh, Kafi, who I, I see in attendees, um, as listed, I think listed as Coffee Dixon, but also contacted us uh, from the Common Good Co-op, um, is in the audience and is available to speak with us about the opportunity for a screening of a reckoning in Boston when that agenda item comes up. So we'll bring that up again. Um, and then I just wanted to issue a reminder. I know it was a super quick turnaround from Friday to Wednesday um, with a holiday in there, uh, but I just wanna encourage everyone if they plan to present anything in our meeting to um, always get it to Jennifer so we can get it in the packet beforehand. Um, it's just so much easier to uh, respond thoughtfully if we've had a chance to, to read things beforehand. So just throwing that out there and we'll try to make sure the meetings give us enough time to do that in the future. Um, a quick review of the agenda. We have uh, seven items today, um, uh, including the screening, uh, the census, um, more talk about uh, email and how this committee can uh, have, you know, interface even more with the public than beyond uh, these public meetings. Um, and then I updates about finance, legal, and visioning, and then all of our standing meetings at the end, our standing uh, items at the end. So um, finally, the other thing we need to do um, is to uh, approve the minutes from last Friday. Uh, were there any? Nope. No, I have them and I didn't put them in the packet. So I can't oh. anticipate you guys to. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> to approve so them. So we'll defer them to the next meeting. That sounds great and totally understandable. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, so Michelle, over to you. Great. Yes. Um, now we will open it up for our first of two public comment periods. And if you'd like to speak in public comment, you'll have up to three minutes. We will not be responding to public comment, but we will certainly be listening and taking notes. If you'd like to make a public comment now, please raise your hand and Jennifer will let you in. And again, there will be a public comment period that will happen at the end of the meeting as well. Okay, so Kathy has her hand raised. And just to clarify for Kathy, um, so this is the public comment period, um, which you're welcome to speak at. And we also hope to bring you back, Kathy, during the um, first portion of our agenda. Um, the item of the screening is the first item that we'll be talking about tonight. Thank you, Michelle. So I'll table my comments and open the floor up to another um, public comment and wait for the portion um, on the agenda regarding the documentary. Thank you. Perfect, thank you. So if there are any other public comments, please feel free to raise your hand. All right. So I think we can go ahead and move into our action and discussion items. Um, and so Kafi, you're right here, we'll bring you back. <laughs> Although, um, so just to sort of preface by saying, this is uh, something that we spoke about last week and it sounded like there was a solid um, 
support of exploring this a bit more. And um, Kafi was generous enough to join us this evening. If there's no objection. I don't think we need to vote to bring Kafi um, here to, to answer our questions and offer a little bit more background on this. So we'd like to bring Kafi in to do that now. If there's an objection, we can vote on whether or not um, to move toward doing that. So if you could just give me a thumbs up if you're good with it, um, and then we'll bring Kafi in. Okay, so um, it looks like maybe we wanna have a discussion um, first to, um, see if this is the time to bring Kafi in uh, to discuss the reckoning in Boston screening. So um, if you'd like to address this, please go ahead and raise your hand and. I don't usually like to call people out, but Alexis, uh, Dr. Shabazz, or, or if you're the three folks who didn't, <laughs> there we go, <laughs> didn't uh, give a thumbs up. So we'd love to hear from you. Sorry. Um, I just didn't see that other people were giving thumbs up. I'm sorry. So I, yes, I'm interested in hearing about um, the film. I'm also interested. I was actually reading something on uh, another part of my screen at the time, but uh, uh, yeah, so we're we're good to go. Good. Okay. Excellent. And Irv, are you you're good with that as well? Oh yeah, I was uh, lost in thought. So. <laughs> okay. Excellent. Hal, I saw that you had your thumb up. So, excellent. All right. Let's go ahead and bring Kathy in. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're really excited about this opportunity, and we're going to open the floor to you um, to talk to us about this now. Thank you so much. Um, I now feel a little less guilty. I think everybody is at the end of their day, <laughs> which I am as well. So I will be brief. Um, again, thank you to the assembly for allowing uh, me to come to uh, tonight's meeting as a representative uh, and co-producer of A Reckoning in Boston. Uh, a Reckoning in Boston has been shown around the country and is airing on PBS in January 2020. In um, hearing the work about the assembly and the foundational work that's being done in Amherst around reparations, one of the things that uh, myself and some of our interns from Tufts and Harvard thought it would be interesting to partner with the assembly and doing a screening and even more importantly, holding a conversation panel after the screening um, to talk about, uh, to contextualize uh, what systematic racial oppression and uh, marginalization, the economic and mental health impact that it has had on communities of color as well as to spearhead the conversation that the work still continues. Uh, we have a fear that once this conversation around reparations is picked up, not just for African-American communities, but also for our indigenous brothers and sisters, that there might be uh, a propensity to um, maybe fall into amnesia about how we continue to hold these conversations up and how we continue to make them impactful and tangible. Uh, a Reckoning in Boston, um, the documentary itself uh, in contextualizing uh, how uh, redlining and, um, you know, Brown versus Ed and uh, many other things within our country and our region, um, how they play out in, in, in modern day access and self-actualization of Black, Brown, and Indigenous communities. Um, again, regathers the conversation and creates a visual insight for the experiences of Black, Brown, and Indigenous who um, experienced the generational oppression that brings forth the conversations around reparations systemically and structurally. Um, in summation, my hope is uh, to uh, join the assembly. We hope to join the assembly 
in the foundational work and uh, conversations you guys have been able to do as a national model and thinking about reparations and um, to act as a guide towards other cities who are beginning to engage the questions of what reparations looks like, um, what it is and what it should be, right? Um, and to do it through a visioning of a reckoning in Boston. And I'm available for questions, of course. Thank you. Thank you so much, Coffee, for that. That was very helpful and inspiring. Um, so yes, if there are any questions, this would be a great time to ask Coffee. Go ahead, Alexis. Um, I guess I'm just curious about the, um, the licensing for this film, if you wouldn't mind speaking to that. As a co-producer, we're working with an impact producer who I think I nearly, uh, I must have stressed her out so many times talking about uh, bringing this documentary to the assembly. I'm so sorry. Um, the, the, you know, there were definitely different directions that people wanted to go with the documentary and who was I, who was our audience, right? Um, Specifically as, again, a generational New Englander and a Black woman, um, part of a BIPOC community, I said our audience are people who are spearheading impactful conversations around uh, uh, healing uh, and um, essentially uh, reconciling, right? Uh, so the licensing conversation would be... Uh, would be uh, fine-tuned by Marga, um, the impact producer. But I, in my belief in the work that uh, has been done in uh, Amherst by the assembly, um, I would definitely advocate uh, for uh, the needs of the assembly as far as accessing a documentary and using it as a tool. And possibly maybe even archiving it if that's something that makes sense for the assembly. Wow, okay, thank you. Dr. Shabazz. Well, thank you, Kafi. If I understood that answer, it sounds as though you were, you're basically generously sharing uh, the screening of the film to us. Um, and uh, that being the case, uh, I do thank you for that offer. Mm -hmm. I uh, also wish to congratulate you as being the, uh, founder of Boston's first uh, worker own, owner uh, cooperative for women and, uh, mm -hmm. and for the work that you've done there. I read as well that you uh, tuned out uh, of school at 15 and went on to uh, make these accomplishments against that backdrop. Uh, and so again, for your resilience and for your your ongoing efforts, uh, thank you as well. What I'm really wondering is um, how do you foresee an impact this documentary might have on a small town like ourself? Mm -hmm. um, we, we're, we're far cry from, from the scale of Boston. Um, redlining or uh, spatial oppression such as it existed uh, in Amherst definitely was on a different scale and context than Boston, but what knowing the film as you do and how it, how it, it impacts uh, audiences, what do you think might be a takeaway for our town in, in, uh, in, in, in screening this, this documentary? I, I, I thank you for reading my background. I forget how much information is out there about me and the vulnerability I brought into the documentary as a woman of color and asking other women of color to speak to generational, uh, the, uh, how uh, space relates to them, right? Uh, municipality and space from their historic experiences and generational experiences. So um, I, I ask Amherst not to sell yourself short as a small town. You're a small town that took up a big conversation, a huge conversation. And although I, I, my love and endearment for Boston um, is not solely in Boston it, and it's not solely in Massachusetts and the, the, the region of New England and 
the the successes and the failures, but even holding up the successor successor successes as thought leaders in conversations from abolition work forward right? Um, the good and the bad of abolition, because I don't want to say that everybody who uh, held the conversation for abolition uh, necessarily um, also saw um, people of color as equals, right? But how do I hold the conversation? How do I see the conversation in Amherst? One, in a very practical level. Um, and this is not to speak ill of my city. Again, uh, Boston is doing this work but the small town of Amherst picked up this conversation well before the city of Boston. And in looking at that, the, the leading that thought, right? One of the, the, the factual things, uh, according to the census, is the city of Boston is losing its African-American community. Um, you might even, as we think about the migration from the South to the Midwest, to Chicago, there is actually a migration going on within our region that is unspoken and untended to. Uh, you know, what have happened to the children? Where have they gone? A lot of the African-American community, they're not moving out of the city of Boston. They're moving, they're migrating across the state. And some of them will, and if not have, ended up in a central mass, Western mass, um, straddling the borders of Connecticut, straddling the borders of Vermont, Pittsfield, right? Uh, the city of Boston, unfortunately, in, in uh, the mannerisms and what it, which it tended to uh, it's displaced homeless communities, shipped these communities all throughout the state of Massachusetts into homeless shelters. And um, uh, uh, what is it, subsidized based uh, housing. The conversation about reparations brings up another larger conversation about the culture of African-Americans um, and right, again, the successes and the failures of supporting the community in the region. If we can bring those, those conversations again, back to community the impact, even in the small town of Amherst, the Uni University of the U UMass Amherst and Amherst College to also a very liberal open space and thinking about relationship to space, is to create even a deeper understanding for who will be their neighbor. And to understand that indigenous and African-American people have always embodied the region of New England. And we're founders with a deep history. And unfortunately through racism and bigotry and, and misunderstanding, right? A lot of the legacy and the a lot of the education, the legacy, the economic development that could have done, been done from Boston all the way over to Great Barrington was uh, taken away from us in an intention potentially to either marginalize us and for some to annihilate. The impact of holding the documentary by the assembly in Amherst, again, is to to stay ahead of that conversation as our communities begin to change. And I'm not just talking about our communities um, as uh, African-Americans, as indigenous, I'm talking about our communities as I, we just did a screening at Tufts um, in, in our nod to uh, the Asian American community, the Asian community in Chinatown that's also being displaced at the pace that African-Americans are being displaced and that also are trying to organize around what it looks like um, to push back against gentrification. In fact, not just from developers, but from a university. So the impact of Amherst holding this conversation is one for me, Amherst holding it in a safe space. I consider it a safe space. Um, there's a cocktail going on in Boston that is still the old guard against the new guard, old Boston against new Boston, that still has a very capitalistic perspective involved in it. 
that will slow roll this conversation where you've already arrived as an assembly. My last point on working with the impact is my perspective in this work as a cooperative is based in history and presence. Um, cooperatives have always been a stronghold for marginalized communities, African-American communities to exist in violent spaces. The creation of the Common Good Co-op, which was originally the Women of Color Co-op, was a nod to existing in violent spaces cooperatively and pushing back against that violence with understanding tools and resources. And in some aspects around our workshop with love and acceptance. As more people move out to Central Mass and Western Mass, their needs, my feeling is that what will be required to build better communities will be not just charitable assistance, but in deep dignity, capital investment. My hopes around the impact and doing in a partnership with the assembly is to call the community uh, CDFIs, uh, stakeholders in economic investment to provide communities that are probably coming there in trauma of being displaced in a way that away from their families, the dignity around what building new communities looks like and the economic investment that was taken from us that may need to be shored back up. So uh, my perspective is to do a partnership with the assembly and to call on our financial institutions to um, foresee the economic and capital investment that should be uh, prepared for to build stronger communities and not just for African-Americans, but stronger communities for all of our domestic migrants, new um, Americans, generational communities to actually give them um, what we haven't had for a long time, which is a fair start. Um, and that's what the, the small town or the town of Amherst, <laughs> Amherst can be a beacon alongside places like Brattleboro, Vermont, Burlington, Vermont, uh, places like uh, Windsor, Connecticut, Great Barrington, which, which what once was Martha's Vineyard, right? Uh, which once was the Inkwell and is now Martha's Vineyard. So the small town, uh, which took on a large conversation, can continue that large conversation with a projected voice, again, around capital investment into communities that are unfortunately being displaced into all over the state of Massachusetts. But how do we receive those communities and how do we resource them? Thank you so much, Kafi. Thank you. That was really um, helpful. And I see that Dr. Jemison's hand is also raised. Yeah, thank you, uh, Michelle, and thank you, Kafi. Um, what I wanted to ask next, actually, was, uh, it's the boring part, but it's uh, it's logistics, right? <laughs> um, it, you know, one of the things this committee will need to know, I think, to, to do the, the best job um, with putting on a screening is sort of like a little bit of uh, what the expectations are on your side, what's, what's needed, and also sort of, um, since you said you would help with hosting the conversation afterward, um, and I think you mentioned in one of your descriptions that you usually bring uh, the director or a couple of other people involved with the film. So could you talk a little bit about like uh, what's needed in terms of uh, film or theater and capacity and uh, what sort of the expectations would be uh, based on events that you've done like this before? Yes, thank you. Uh Interesting enough, we screened at Amherst Theater a few weeks ago. And I think that's how I found out from one of the professors at Amherst College more about the conversation of reparations. So, um, but th this, we, we are primarily due to COVID, uh, you know, technology and, and all of its uh, awesomeness, I guess. Most of our screenings have been virtual. 
one of the things, uh, so we, we do have a system to set up the logistics fairly simply for virtual screenings. So we could uh, in the theater or in the university, I think the, the logistics are fairly simple um, on our end. Uh, it's usually done through show and tell uh, and uh, pre-registration and click a link. And then that attaches to a meeting room where the panel is held typically either through sh show and tell or Zoom, depending on whether the uh, partner and organization is recording it or not. That is super helpful. Thank you. Okay. I, I just have a thought that came to me as, as you were speaking. Um, so we have a food co-op here, the common share food co-op that is not yet um, established as a grocery store, but is working toward that goal. Yeah. Um, and I think this would be something that the board and the leadership in that organization would also be very interested in being involved in and supporting. I may be speaking for them, but I'm, I think I'm pretty confident. Um, so I would, I would love the opportunity to um, also bring them into this conversation. Um, and given, I'm just wondering from the group, given how packed our agenda is tonight um, and how exciting this opportunity is and, um, I'm wondering if we should we should add it as an agenda item for discussion next meeting so that we can really take some time with the information that copy presented and um, and then be able to sort of discuss and deliberate around how we might move forward. Um, unless there are other points of view on that, uh, I think that might be our best bet. I think the we, we might even can move one step further if folks are comfortable. I, I'd like to ask if, if Alexis would particularly uh, look into the screening uh, dynamic, uh, possibly even through Amherst Media, whether um, in the studio, but then also through our own uh, live stream channels and work with, I know this came up at one time when they were discussing um, how to screen um, Elsie Fetterman's uh, documentary on the Holocaust and uh, in the dias diaspora over to to Connecticut in this region. Mm. Um, there was there was talks about how to screen that, and and uh, I, I think Alexis is well positioned to uh, <laughs> to take to maybe uh, uh, interact with Coffee and and really see how what you know and bring us an actual logistical plan. How does that sound, Alexis? Yeah, so um, that's why I, I had asked about licensing so that uh, because that's exactly th that's exactly what I was thinking about. Um, we have a lot of options. Um, I don't know if I I, I don't think I, I need to take up meeting time about it. Um, but, you know, we can handle it behind the scenes. But yes, I am. I am the programming director at Amherst Media, so that is exactly in my wheelhouse, and I can definitely take care of that. Awesome. Can I Are say we all one prepared to do a thumbs up to, to that plan for Alexis to move the logistics? And great. I have a I definite it. thumbs up with that as well, and I want to nod and, and just fin finishing and letting you guys get on with your meeting. Um, and while my dog is walking up and down the stairs waiting for me, <laughs> um, I want to say yes, Michelle. Um, I, I, I very much putter through the whole entire region with my Chautauqua hat on and my Bruins jersey. And one year at the farmer's market, I did have a nice juicy conversation with the uh, Common Share Food Co-op, I think is their name, um, and upholding their work and um, then letting them know that if they ever needed any assistance, you know, to, to holler at me. So I was receiving the emails for a while and that was because I knew they were doing membership raising and there was, there was any way I could contribute to the conversation. Um, the second thing is, uh, the last thing is, um, I guess I'd like to have, a I don't know if this is the appropriate space to have the conversation, but to ask if the assembly does have a fund. If the assembly does have a fund that if there were, um, if people are, are, if they were philanthropic organizations, um, 
that wanted to contribute to the assembly's work and ongoing work and ongoing support of the community, would it would there be a fund that they could contribute to? And did the fund, could the fund necessarily extend to um, to uh, community resourcing? Mm. Would, and if you did not, would you consider <laughs> down the road? Um, I, I guess I'll just say, I think that that gets a little bit, it, we should, we should definitely talk. I will, I will link up with you and yeah, we'll talk about this stuff because I think that it depends on the type of like permissions that we have legally yeah. about it. Well, specifically tied to the stream, I think, okay. um, about collecting donations. But I think that if it were, I, we have to figure that out, but I, I, I will, yeah. I will talk And this about is it. not for our purposes. We just find that if it's really great work, we want to encourage people to keep continuing to that work. And, and do you guys have the ability to absorb that? But that's a whole other conversation. Please feel free to reach out to me via email and uh, James Rutenbeck. Uh, and Marga, uh, impact director, and Carl, Carl also the co-producer, who's uh, an indigenous man himself. And I look forward to re-engaging this conversation. And I, I feel hopeful. And that ex the hopefulness is bringing on a lot of excitement. Um, and as we prepare again, we just did a, an interview with um, Voices of America. And they let me know that there's a reparation conversation happening in Boston. And I was still steadfast about, you know, I, I'd really like to hold that conversation with Amherst. So <laughs> thank you very, very much. And I look forward to hearing from the assembly. Thank you. Thank you, Coffee. And I, Irv, did you have yeah. a question for Coffee before? Um... Yeah, I was, I was trying to understand uh, the um, mentioning of resources was, or those resources and, conjunction with um, the streaming of the film or resources available to this committee in general? Resources available to the committee in general. Oh, yeah, we do um, have Yeah, to the committee in general and to continuing work. I, I really do believe without being, uh, uh, my nerd hat is for soil science, <laughs> not, not, not for statistical research. Um, but I do believe uh, in the understanding that um, there will be new, beautiful, vibrant communities created. And I, maybe it's uh, my optimism and utopian society, sorry, um, that uh, I, I look forward to how Western Mass grows um, and, and, its, and its diversity and its continued diversity. And just um, as we start these conversations, how are we holding resources that people would uh, like to commit to the development of uh, those new communities uh, and um, I guess the anchoring, I guess I would like to say. Stay tuned, Kathy. Stay I tuned, will, Kathy. thank you, Dr. We're, we're working on it. As I understand, we have an account for a fund, but we have no funds in the account. But uh, Irv Rose is about to enlighten us on how we're gonna change that and get some cash in that account. <laughs> Go, oh, Irv. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, Michelle, Jennifer, Dr. Jamila, Heather, Alexis. Reach out to me by email. Look forward to this conversation. <laughs> Have a good night. You bet. Have a good evening. <laughs> Bye. Cool. All right. <laughs> um, and, and not to jump the gun. So we will. We're, Irv, we're all like so ready for your updates. Um, we've got a couple more things we're going to try to get out of the way first. Um, and one of them was to, to talk about this question about the census that came up last week. Um, so I hope people will jump in and correct me if my recollect, recollection was wrong. Um, but I thought we were kind of trying to understand two things. The large overarching question is, can or will the AHRA take over the census process? And if, if we were going to do that, um, how would the funding for that work? Um, and if that complicates the funding, you know, we sort of back to possibly BAM having to do it. So that was my understanding of kind of like where we, we left off. So 
was someone charged with finding out what the procurement process was or, or like what we would need to do to get funding? And Irv, sorry, are you, is that hand up for this already? Um, I, I, I think it's, I thought it was going to be all parties at the presentation because they oh, all- Oh, perfect. Okay. That was into there. Got anyway. It. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm okay with, can we just sort of like do all the money now? Would anybody be sad about that? <laughs> I think I missed what just what Irv, what did you just say, Irv, that you were ready to present on the fin financial piece? Yeah, Is that right, because that was my charge and um, I'm ready to go through it. And there are questions and there are issues and there are also answers. All right. And I Good. think that might include the, the census piece as well. So, right. Yeah. Sure. So we just are going to move a little out of order, bump up the finance on the agenda, and then come back to these other pieces. Is that correct? Is everyone yes. good with that? Okay. Uh, well, yeah, <laughs> folks, people. Okay. <laughs> Alexis, you good with that? All right. <laughs> and Halla, I'm gonna I'm gonna assume you are, if in, unless you tell us otherwise. Okay. Great. Take it away, Dr. Rhodes. So I had a um, great conversation. Jennifer was in atten attendance uh, with Sean, uh, the finance director uh, today. I was really encouraged and I was really, I, I came in with a whole list of questions and we went through that list of questions, uh, every last one of them, in fact. Um, but uh, so, let me just start by going through the questions and then uh, uh, then uh, providing some input in terms of how uh, Sean looked at it. And Jennifer, you can jump in at any point in time and please do. So my, my first question was, when and how much money will be added to the stabilization fund? The second part of the question was, can annual deposits authorized by the council be deposited into the stabilization stabilization fund on an annual and continuous basis. So the answer to the first question is that uh, once the um, um, free cash is certified, which will be any day now, as I understand it, then that money can be moved into the stabilization fund and that's $200,000 plus. Um, and uh, Sean talked somewhere around uh, by November. That, that would be in an account. So there will be that amount in account. That, uh, by the way, is exactly the same amount of money the council had authorized in the beginning. All right. Uh, the second part of the question, which was of interest to me, was I, uh, can annual deposits authorized by the council be deposited? into the stabilization fund on an annual and continuous basis. Yes, they could be. Uh, because uh, when free, uh, when there is a surplus, that surplus can uh, go into different accounts. So uh, for instance, if we were able to say, hey, look, we would like to have 10% of that surplus go into the stabilization fund on an annual basis uh, to fund our projects, yes, that could happen. We can, that is something if we want to make that happen, we can have make that happen on an annual basis. The uh, challenge uh, would be uh, to get this before the council and say, uh, and say uh, we would like to have 10% of the surplus that goes, uh, that would be going into the stabilization fund. Uh, Company may have to free cash put into the stabilization fund on an annual basis from now on. In other words, make it permanent and have that vote so that it's permanent. A any questions on that? Um, yeah, so they're depositing money this year. And then, so for us to make that request for an annual deposit permanently. When is that, is that business we can do any time or does it have to be done sometime in the next month, six months, something yeah, like I, that? I, would, I, I, think, I think I um, what I would like to do is make it a continuing resolution um, that uh, is brought before the council 
Uh, and I guess what I'm saying is that I would like for that to be a line item in the budget uh, going forward. That's what I uh, would like to have happen. And we need to um, get busy on it if, if we are going to do that. In other words, we'd have to vote for it. And uh, I think what we would do is before we vote, uh, we would get additional information, uh, get our language together, and then have that brought before the council uh, for action. Thank you, I love a plan. <laughs> um, and to follow up on that question, Irv, um, the, the funds that you're saying could be deposited on an annual basis, are they only funds from that free cash account? Is that what you're referring to? Or let's say, is cannabis up for discussion? Did any any conversation happen around that? Uh, you're jumping down the, the line. Okay. But, fair enough, fair enough. But you know, let me ask, answer that question right now, because this, this is an issue that came up in uh, Sean and I guess Paul uh, would uh, like uh, all the money that we want to we want to have for our use deposited into the stabilization fund from cannabis, from CPAC, from all sources. All right. I, uh, for one, uh, do not like that idea. And the reason for it is, uh, and so the pros of doing that is, as Sean said, well, you know, it's always going to be there. And so you continuously build up this fund built from all sources, all right? And so it's always there and you don't have to spend it on an annual basis. You could spend it over time if you want it, all right? Uh, the, and, and, and that's a pro. The con is if we took all the sources of financing and allow them to be de deposited in a stabilization fund in order for us to get them out, we would have to have a two third majority vote and the town council every time we wanted to move the move money out of there. To me, that's a negative. Some people there may not think that's a negative, uh, but but I do, um, and maybe it isn't. I, I mean, I, and maybe you know, the, you know, my um, fear is that uh, at some point where we have a project or uh, that we want to move forward with. Um, or our successors or whatever want to move forward with, people would have to come back to the council and get a two thirds majority vote. The other problem with that is that we're done in June, in June, uh, June, June 30th, we're done. So what is going to be our legacy in, in terms of money to spend on a going forward basis? And how are those decisions going to be made when this group will no longer exist? So, go ahead, Jennifer. Yep, I just wanted to say I think that part of um, Sean's reason for everything being deposit into the stabilization fund is because otherwise it becomes a line item on the budget, which means if we don't use it, we lose it. And it gets put into the mass general fund. Right. So I think that that was that, right. that double-sided edge, which you, you know, implied, but. Yeah, it's, it, it, but again, our challenge, our, our challenge is that we can, we can identify money to spend but we have a limited time available to us to make decisions on how that money is going to be spent. And, and one more time, we can have 200,000 in this account. We can have uh, money um, in, uh, go on to a line item from cannabis. We can have all kinds of money happening. But the question is, how much time do we have to spend that as a committee, as this committee? We're out of business, June 30th. Thank you for bringing that up. That's actually sort of something that's been in my head is, you know, what will decision-making structures look for this, look like for this money as we go forward? Um, so um, I, I'd love to see that be a, a agenda item for discussion um, in the future. Um, I, I bolded it in my notes and I see Michelle is, is putting it down. So Irv, that is a great question and I, I, I will definitely tackle it. 
Um, I would love to hear the rest of your questions and answers though as well. All right, so here, the other one was, uh, and this goes to some other, other items. Uh, does spending under $1,000 need to go through the procurement process? No, it doesn't have to go through the formal procurement process where you have to go out to a bid, et cetera. In fact, anything under $10,000 does not need to go out to, to bid or through the regular procurement process. All right, so that comes back to the question about census. Uh, so in terms of spending uh, money on the census, we would have to decide how much money we're talking about and who is going to do the work, do that work on the census. If it's going to be a, a private, another group or a nonprofit group doing it, then uh, as Sean said, then you go through what is called, uh, you know, best business practice and you look at, the one goes through the, uh, is, does the group or um, organization have some kind of track record that would, it would be able to demonstrate that it could handle the task correctly? The good thing about that, you don't have to go through the bidding process. So yes, the other the other thing that came up in relationship to this was the, the website, and I'm going to get that out of the way right now. Uh, yes, we can spend money on that website. The suggestion was made um, that uh, let the town go ahead and do that website, set it up for us, the entire thing, and have it be the African Heritage Reparation Assembly website. That can be done. The question for us is, do we want it to have it that way, or do we wish wish to have some other private group um, that is, you know, that may be uh, a minority uh, owned firm do that work? Again, if it's under if it's under ten thousand dollars, it does not need to go out to to through the procurement process or bid, but it would have to be a reputable group. That is a question. That needs to be answered by this group, and we'd have to talk about it, discuss it, to see how we want want to move on that. Any questions are, on that? Yeah, are there um, when you say reputable, are there specific criteria, and also who gets to make the decision about reputable? Is that us or is that? That's uh, the town manager. Town manager. Okay, great. Um, and then this wasn't necessarily exactly about money, but it was sort of a question. Um, it sounds like Sean suggested the town of Amherst putting the website together. If Alexis, which she, she said, oh, I, I, I've got a, I can do those sorts of things, was going to put the website together. Um, one, is that a conflict? Two, would we basically just have to like vet her as a reputable? Uh, yes, interesting question. I mean, I just finished the uh, conflict of interest uh, course. <laughs> so, uh, Alexis, not, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you're uh, you're not an employee of the um, town of Amherst. No. Uh, and if we're talking about Alexis, or we're talking about uh, Alexis herself doing it or doing it through Amherst Media. Um. That's not a service that I provide through Amherst Media, so it would be through like free or like a, like a subcontract or a contract. All right, so uh, you would be doing it as an independent contractor? That is correct. All right. Now, the only, the only um, I don't see an issue with that, but the, the town may, might uh, or might or might not, um, they would, then ask the question of you, Alexis, in terms of your qualifications, et cetera, so that they could get comfortable and saying, hey, you can go out, you can do this work. And by the way, if you decided to do the work, um, and, 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 and here's what I would advocate, since that you obviously have the skills to do it, I would advocate for the, for the work to be done by you. And the reason for that is that the, you can't get paid until the work is done. Um, well, I mean, typically what happens is that there's like a deposit. And so 
Not on your it does. So, well, so before we go it, right? <laughs> too deep on this but, one. So I think that I, I already feel like there's a problem like with me. Yeah. So I'm going to, yeah. <laughs> Let's, um, I see that um, Jennifer has her, was raising her hand and also Councillor Brewer, our liaison is here and has her hand raised. So I think it would be great to hear from both of them. Yeah. So first, you guys are special municipal employees, I believe. You have the SME char cha charge and um, I've never seen a committee member subcontract, but that's not to say that it couldn't happen. But I'm pretty sure that that is a conflict, although I would agree, Alex, that would be great for you to do that. Um, and there was, and the way that we work is we don't pay until the work is done typically, or we, you can, what you can do is you can set it into stages. So like you have like stage one, this part of it is done and then you get paid a portion of it and then you have stage two and then the next portion can be paid for. But I can let, um, Oh, Miss Brewer, and and then she can speak on it some more. Hi, Lissa. What Jennifer said, <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm so glad you had her speak first. You're all municipal employees. That's true. You have special municipal employee status as well, which gives you a little more leeway in terms of this exact sort of conflict of interest, but it's more about you being able to interact with a different body of the town or a different department of the town. Like if Alexis had a landscaping business, so it wasn't about reparations, it was about landscaping and she wanted to do landscaping work for the town, that would be in a different position. It's unlikely that she would be able to do work for this committee, but look at special municipal employee status. One of you dig into that when you're doing your ethics training and that should help you answer the questions as to what's possible. They give a bunch of examples in the, in the conflict of interest training. And obviously then once you have that sorted out, then you just go ask Sean a bunch more questions as Irv indicated. Thanks. Thank you. Alyssa and Irv, I see your hand. Yeah, so, you know, uh, Alyssa, you know, I, I, again, I just finished that course yesterday. I finished that course. And yes, Alexis could as if, her, if we gave her and the town gave her an exemption because she's a special municipal employee. Um, she could do that work. The exemption would have to be extended by the town. So I think without ta town manager Bachelman here, we're going to want to table this um, particular piece of the discussion. Um, but I do think that uh, all of the information that you provided, Herb, around the possibility of us moving forward with developing the census is something that we should come back to here and um, and decide as a group if, and I'd love to hear from uh, Dr. Shabazz. I know we had briefly talked about you touching base with somebody at BAM or some other folks there. And so maybe there's some feedback that is available. Before we go to Dr. Shabazz, I just want to uh, make sure that if we are going to do something, and I think we should do something in the area of the census, and of the website. Um, if, if we want a website, we need to vote on that and say, yes, we want that website and we would like the town to do it or we will find someone else to do it. But let's, let's make a decision so we have something that was done. Secondly, in terms of the census, we need to make a decision as to whether we want, this, uh, we want to do this and how we see it being done because it's not really defined. I mean, there are, what are the tasks that are going to be there? And then we can assign uh, a monetary amount to those tasks. But if we are serious, let's move on that, make some decisions, and then uh, move forward. Great. Dr. Shabazz. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Irv, for your overall report. I'd like to- uh, By the way, uh, I'm not finished with that report. So maybe we should continue to, to have you complete the report now, because I don't want to speak to just one, one item. I have comments on all, I, all parts of your report. So please, I, I yield. All right, so let me just, I'm gonna go through the, through the uh, 
there was, uh, I asked the question is, how was money appropriated for the shower trailer for Craig's doors? Uh, if you follow newspaper items, there was a shower trailer that was happened. And the reason that was of interest to me is that that money was going, was appropriated. Where did it come from? How, how did that happen? Because my, obviously my interest was in, well, if you can do it for Craig's doors, why wouldn't you be able to do it for reparations if all the legal things? So it turns out that that came through CARES money, which is part of uh, the COVID money. And that's a whole other topic we will talk about later on in here. All right. The other question is, is how can CPAC money be used for reparation purposes? And what is the process? Um, two parts that there were two two things there. The um, CPAC process is, is is virtually over. However, there is a, a supplemental part of about five hundred thousand uh, dollars that uh, and that they always have in reserve that we can um, target for our purposes if we so wish. The other question I had was, uh, can uh, CPAC use money? Uh, to fund projects via a bonding process. And yes, they can. Why is that important to us? Is that uh, let's say that we wanted to have a building of some kind and we want to have, want to have uh, the ability to pay for that over the course of the next 20 years. That's CPAC, that's bonding money. And they have done that and they do do that kind of thing uh, already. All right. Uh, Uh, the other thing was looking at the town ownership of a building and then that building being used for specific purposes by um, uh, the African heritage for its uh, for a project or projects. Uh, and yes, the town can do that. That is something that they've done. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the issues around that all come back to the legal parameters that we have to deal with in terms of how we target the use of that money, money to what populations? Uh, how can and where in the various budget accounts can um, the heritage, African Heritage Reparation Association tap into sustainable funds for projects? That's all within our purview. It is those knowing that those funds are available and having them as budget accounts and budget items and line items that's up to us to identify and to pursue through the regular council process. And, and then I went into a couple of things which just were, were items that I thought we need to have some information on is how can we use money for various um, after school and before, before school projects um, that are uh, being funded partially or in full by the town or, or that we could have supplement. And, and again, those are things that we would have to discuss. Um, and from my point of view, those things are very, very possible. And Sean was the same thing. So that ends my report. Did you, did we talk about cannabis and I missed that or no? And I did, I did say cannabis, cannabis, cannabis money is available to us. Okay. The impact, the impact, part, the impact funding part of that is, we, we don't even want to think about that. But the tax money that comes in, yes, that is available for us. Okay. Thank you. And Dr. Shabazz, I think you said you had some comments. Thank you. And thank you, um, uh, Dr. Rhodes, for all your digging on those items. Let me raise some points and then I actually have, if it's possible, uh, a motion for folks to entertain, if not for this meeting, another meeting uh, on the basis of at least one of the items. First of all, with reference to the uh, deposits to the stabilization fund, I would like for us to um, be kept abreast of the uh, certification of the free cash and of the depositing to that account. The co-chairs could make a note of that. And I think that will be a, be a historic moment for the town with, uh, with respect to 
that actual step being taken and completed. Um, uh, along with that, the question of annual deposits on a continue on a and going towards some sort of continuing uh, fund. I think that the um, this is something we ought to be aiming to get ourselves perhaps to a place that we can make a recommendation in our October report, our, our report at the end of October, um, which is basically to say that um, we do imagine a uh, the stabilization fund uh, constituting a discrete pool of money that would not be spent on, or, or that we're gonna recommend expenditures of in this cycle of our assembly. That is by our June report, we're gonna recommend this 200K that's in there be spent X, Y, or Z way. I would like for us to, to be at a place where, where we're clear by our October report that, that we, we countenance a fund emerging by this June uh, that, that will be set uh, earning interest that future, a future body will uh, actually determine how, that, how resources in that uh, pool, in that fund, in that endowment uh, would be spent, but that we're not trying we're not aiming by our October report or by our final June report to actually say, this is how funds going into that stabilization fund, this is specifically where we want it spent before we, as we go out of commission in June. I don't think that should be in our, on our docket, but that's, that's my input to that. Um, so that's the, the second uh, item about all funds going into this stabilization fund. I, I don't like the sound of that. That sounds a bit nebulous and confusing. I think in fact, what we ought to be thinking about both for our, our October report in and, and in definite ways by our June report is what we might refer to as a fund development strategy. So this stabilization fund that right now is an empty account, but we foresee money's going into it, we ought to be thinking through before our final report in June, a strategy for developing that fund. What amount we see it growing toward, how we see it being set up to, uh, 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 to fund projects on a continue, you know, that, that on, on, a, on an annual basis, that come before it as proposals, that's all something we need to develop a strategy around. So if it's cannabis, some amount from cannabis, if it's some percentage of the surplus free cash from year to year, we, we look at what all those possible uh, uh, funding sources are. And yes, over the next few years, there would be a funding strategy, a fund development strategy that would say if we, look at these sources coming in over the next three years or five years, we might project that in five years time, this fund would be built up to $10 million or might be built up to whatever the, the math would show. And that at that point, it could begin to be distributed toward projects that a future body would be would be in would be that as as our co-chair said that decision making structure. So those are my my thoughts in relation to that that we need to have on our radar uh, to definitely propose by our June report a fund development strategy. So now we have information on the fund that's been created on a forthcoming deposit to that fund on other possible streams that could go into that fund. Let's think through a fund development strategy with Sean Magano in looking at what these likely sources could be. What if we got the council, if we recommended to the council that they would approve specific percentages out of surpluses 
surplus or free cash, out of cannabis revenue, out of whatever the mix of potential sources might be, that that would go into a, an actual strategy that would actually create a fund that at some future date would then be able to go on from that point on offering annual disbursements. The question of the website, the census of spending um, under $10,000, not requiring, not requiring, that was a, me. excuse me. Okay. That, that this question of whether it goes through procurement or not through procurement, I think we're, we're, um, we need to get, get a little clear on, on, on what we're after. First of all, my concern about a website and the census building process is such, sorry for that, is such that it's not as time sensitive as our October report. I think we've got some, we can take some time to deliberate and to, to move toward the question of um, uh, how we uh, get the census created. Um, because again, the census is about a process of getting the will of the injured, harmed community, the harmed community about projects. So it, it's not immediate. It, this is not as crucial as some of the other items I think we need to be signaling about for our October report. I'd love to see it done sooner rather than later, but it's not as, to me, as pressing. And, and so here's my specific motion in relation to that. Um, I move that we, uh, the Amherst Heritage Reparations Assembly, authorize the creation of a website via the town of Amherst. I so I would that. like, pardon? I second that. So shall we have discussion? That would be a good time. Yeah, let's do that. So I do think consistent with things we've talked before, I think uh, Alexis was making a point or Hala was making a point on even how we're documenting our current process that uh, of, this, of this assembly, of this town body itself, that there ought to be a website where that information over the coming months through the release of our report in June has space, perhaps beyond the, the little space currently on the town website, but a little space where links can be provided, where information can be provided above and beyond our packets, um, things anticipating if we, if we do promote a screening, work out a screening of a day of reckoning, um, that, that we would have a, a little, a, a website that could operate to inform the community, inform the public, um, providing our information. And again, what that looks like, how much it, it may build off of the existing space on the town of Amherst website, I would leave that for others to, to, to look into. But I do think that we ought to look at um, and this is just consistent with the way CPAC has a website, the way uh, the Amherst Historical Society, the Amherst Local Historic Commissions, uh, planning to, you know, all of these bodies have websites where they share the information and progress of the work. I see no problems. Uh, I, I think we, we should empower the, um, uh, uh, the creation or the building out of the of, of our website via the town of Amherst. Can I ask a, just a clarifying question? Um, Dr. Shabazz, is your proposal just that we have a website period, not specifically that we, that that website that we're creating is for the census? No, and exactly. And, okay. and, and thus the question of how this ties in with the census is another one that right now I think is in a little bit you know, murkier waters we need to clarify. But what I'm saying is, regardless of uh, whether this, the, the AHRA's website becomes or, or the platform for building the and reporting the Black Census or to what extent it as part of the outreach, that can all be determined at a later point. 
but the the value of us having a space where where we share with the public, we document with the public, um, all the things that are possible in a website, particularly a blog based type of web, website, but but whatever type, um, I think is valuable and something that uh, I'd like us to empower um, through 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 the through the town. And just add, oh, sorry, Dr. Jemison, go ahead. Just another another yeah. question is about uh, specifically, so um, who decides what the content is and who's putting it up there? Good question. Obviously the uh, content's gonna have to be decided by this body uh, and people who really wanna work on it. Um, and obviously the town is gonna to be doing it and it's gonna be assigned to a specific person we're going to have to have some robust input into that in terms of what's going to go on there. Uh, uh, so um, yeah, it's, it's going to be yes, we're going to have to make those kinds of decisions. And I would add that I, I very much support this recommendation. And if we look at Evanston as a model, they have put together an excellent municipal website that is specific to their reparations work. And it was incredibly useful um, for, for us as we were moving through this earlier stage of the process. And I know a lot of people are using those resources. So, um, and I'm also wondering, <laughs> um, I know Jennifer, I don't know if Jennifer would be um, tasked with the content aspects of this, but um, as much as we could do to provide the resources and things like that um, to Jennifer, um, you know, I just want to make sure that I heard what Irv said that that there was a um, an option for having a more built out reparations website of the town, but I'm also a little bit uh, I guess just have some questions about the time and the commitment that that requires. Jennifer, yeah, I mean it just seems like this is. Again, it's a, a committee with the short term, and I'm and I'm always like a little bit flabbergasted by that. And so I, I mean, it seems like it needs there needs to be a standing committee. You can't just dump funds and expect this group to lay out what's going to happen over the next thirty years, right? <laughs> so I, um, I, I mean, I, I that should you might want to think about having that as a recommendation, whether it's this group in the, or a new group of folks or, or part of you guys continue on with the work because um, yes, we can't have a website and then not have the committee behind the website anymore. That doesn't make any sense. And right, yes, I can throw stuff on it as it comes to me, but that's what you guys are supposed to be doing is feeding, you know, um, so I would just think about that. Right, like how to either you guys need to extend or make it standing, or you know, and then Dr. Shabazz. Yeah, there, yeah you know, there is going to have to be an ongoing group, committee, etc., that is uh, going to be charged with the expenditure of funds over time over time uh, as it relates to the funds that we establish. Uh, and we obviously could uh, decide upon the criteria, et cetera, of those funds expenditures, but someone's going to have to be able uh, to make a decision. So Jennifer, you're correct. We, we uh, need to be thinking about how, do, how those funds get, get expended after our time is up. And my recommendation would be that uh, we recommend and our final report that a standing committee be uh, put together who makes those decision, decisions. And that committee can change over time, but it is a committee that will be charged with um, deciding upon how those funds are expended. Dr. Shabazz? Yeah, so back to the motion at hand though, um, that, that's all good for other future recommendations. But for the motion at hand, 
um, what I'm hearing from you, uh, Jennifer, is that we can build out either from the present space that we already have on the town of Amherst website or potentially through some other uh, aspects and that on the larger level, then we might also want to make recommendation. But I'm really envisioning what are our web based resources for sharing the work of this assembly between now and June. I'm looking at those specific months that, for example, we are considering uh, partnering with Amherst Media and perhaps others to have this screening and discussion of an important documentary that may raise questions about, about space as part of visioning reparations in this town. We want a way to promote that. Uh, we want a way to have an event bright or have something that can be there for the registration. I wouldn't outsource that to Amherst Media if they do join us as a partner in the screening, which we don't know as yet, but, but I wouldn't want to outsource that. I'd like, if this body is the one approving it, the Amherst Her uh, African Heritage Reparations Assembly of the town of Amherst, I would like this body to be able to have its own space on the World Wide Web to promote this event or down the road if we have a public hearing about some 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 aspect of our work leading up to our final report in june where is the internet resources for doing that i think we ought to be thinking about that we ought to be building out if it does involve some some resources to do it then i think we need to have the discussions to get the resources but this this uh, vote on the floor is really about over the next several months through June, how do we develop? Because I don't want to just burden existing staff helping us who have uh, that a staff that already has numerous other committees and councils and, and whatnot they work with. I'm really wondering if we envision there is some work that to go out on the web, um, between now and June, that we are appropriate, this bill, this motion on the floor is saying we agree to that and we're asking for the town to help us create those, find those resources to do what we need to do on the web. I would like uh, to call the question. Uh, yes, uh, go ahead, Eric. I said I called the question. Oh, sorry? I so called the question. Roll, roll call. Oh. Roll. Uh, so he's calling the question, but it sounds like uh, Dr. Jemison maybe had an additional piece of. Well, I saw Jennifer's uh, hand up. Okay. But if, uh, but if you if you did, <laughs> but now I'm getting the no. I no, I think I was trying to respond to something that Dr. Shabazz was saying, and then I I don't know I. I was typing and 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 lost it, but w whatever resources that you need for a website, I mean, there's multiple things that we can do. And if you whatever it is that you want guys want to build, we can bring that to our department here and they will either say this is something that we can handle or they'll say we don't have the bandwidth and you guys are going to need to hire out right so it's as simple as that but we got to know what it is that you guys want to do right because we can put resources on the current what we have now currently but it's not as but you know big and and exciting because it's got all of the other governmental stuff on it right and so what i'm hearing from this group is you want something that's more dedicated to ahra itself and so that could possibly be done through us I mean, i spoke to her today after we met with sean and she said you guys just got to bring it to us and we'll figure out if we have the capabilities of doing that excellent thank you that's really helpful that clarification <laughs> um so verve has called the question which means we now will move to a uh, vote a roll call vote um Correct? Is that right? And <laughs> stop me if I'm wrong. <laughs> okay. Um, so, Irv. Aye. Dr. Shabazz. Aye. Yes. Alexis. Aye. Dr. Jemison. 
Nay. And Hala. Lord, I. And Miller, I. So that motion passes. One, two, three, four, five, yes, and one no. And thank you, Dr. Shabazz, for bringing that forward. Okay, so where are we? <laughs> uh, well, I, a couple of more things left on herbs. Right, you were, yes. Yeah. But, uh, but thank you all before, for that. Vote. Before you go on, Dr. Shabazz, I just want to check in with Hala and Alexis and just know that there's going to be additional space to come, you know, to, um, to discuss any of Herb's findings um, as well. Can I just jump in quickly? Because I'm going back. To, I moved that the AHRA authorized the creation of a website via the town of Amherst. And so uh, you were saying about this over the, the amount of time that we work. So I don't know if you wanted to refine that and include that into the motion. Because this makes it sound like we're starting this tomorrow, which could very well be. But I know that you had mentioned and we're very strict about like the AHRA that's current and the time constraint that it has. Yeah, I, I will work with, with uh, you and the communications department or wherever you direct me uh, to, to begin to identify uh, using the Evanston one as a model. And, uh, and then of course, all of that coming back to this body to, to, uh, to, to agree or, or tweak or modify. But yes, I, I can get with you on, on that. Um, and, and, you know, and again, whether it becomes part of the June report to keep it going, that's all to be determined down the line. But I think for right now, we're just trying to identify how we can, I'll, I'll work with you to identify what potential um, social media, internet, website support um, AHRA could use and, uh, and, and then begin to be able to come back and report to the assembly what, what we found out and what, what we may be recommending as a, uh, as a kind of space. As far as the other two items and then others, certainly I know want to weigh in on, on what uh, Irv brought us, but the, um, uh, the questions that you found out about um, CPAC and the, the supplemental kitty, I hope from the visioning work uh, to have something to bring to this body to, to look to support um, that would, would go toward the CPAC and the, and the supplemental funding. Um, uh, that was interesting what you found out about a bonding process. I think that underscores, uh, but I don't want to dovetail into um, the legal discussion that, that Michelle uh, will bring, but it does dovetail the question of the legal model of CPAC as something that we might be recommending going forward for, for this work. Uh, and then finally, um, the, uh, the question of uh, sustainable funds for projects. No, really the question of the, the census building. I just will uh, wait until after uh, BAM has its next meeting and can be able to discuss uh, its role on that work. The, uh, we already know that the, you know, the clerks, town clerk's office and other potential sources, we really don't want to bother them till after the election. Their, their, their plate is really rather full on trying to pull at some of those um, databases that might support um, uh, the census building work. So again, I don't think, I don't have anything concretely to say in response to Irv's report on some of that information right now. But thank you again for all of that. And I yield to others. Um, Irv, I don't know. Did you want to talk about CDBG or did you talk about CDBG? No, I, I didn't. I didn't. And, and that's the community block grant money uh, that's done on an annual basis. That is another source of funds that we could tap into. Thank you, Jennifer. I, I mm -hmm. told you that about that. And just to piggyback on that, um, was there any discussion about the, um, the American Rescue Plan funds. I don't know if I just the ARPA funds. Yes, thank Those you. Are ARPA. Yeah, there was discussion, and that was uh, part of the, what I said. Cares. There's ARPA is a part of that also. 
And so I think the town overall this time with the ARPA funds is trying to do it through the lens of DEI, it, it, you know, and, and making an attempt that it's yeah. trying to move money forwards to um, closing the gaps or, or help filling the gaps across the board, as opposed to just having funds dedicated to one specific thing. They're trying to spread it across. Yeah, and, 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 and what's important about that, DEI is important, but uh, when we look about spending that money uh, that is available, uh, for me, uh, if we can find a window uh, of opportunity to expend those funds on something that we want to do, we certainly uh, could do that. And we certainly would fall into the uh, category of DEI. And just sort of expanding, and we can come back to this at a later time, but um, we're talking about reparations for residents of African descent, and the town is making efforts toward racial equity as a whole, which is what Jennifer's referring to. And so there may be a point in which we want to coordinate with other groups that are working on these things. Because if we're looking, for example, at cannabis, there are some communities that have said, we want to capture X percentage or all of this cannabis money for racial equity. And then it sort of gets determined how that is allocated. And so, um, just to kind of broaden ourselves out a little bit and think about wanting to coordinate with the new um, safety and justice committee that has just been formed, which is an extension of the community safety working group and other um, bodies that may be working on these similar issues. So, <clears throat> great. So thank you so much, Irv, that was all extremely, helpful. Um, and I think we need to decide what next steps we need to take. And we're going to have some time, I hope, to discuss um, agenda items for the next meeting and maybe have a little time <laughs> between now and that next meeting. We literally had one business day from the last meeting um, to get anything done. So I am in awe of all of this work that's been um, produced in that period of time. Um, but I did want to also come back to Alexis and Halla and Dr. Jemison again and just see if there was anything to add in terms of the financial discussion. Yeah, go ahead, Alexis. Um, I guess for me, I was just wondering, um, I guess when, or, okay, are, are we gonna be talking more about that like general racial equity um, situation or is, is that something like, are we, how do we find more information about that? Is that gonna be for next time? I'm sorry, I, I I wasn't sure where we like ended on that. Oh, well, you mean when we said I'm I'm I can't I'm having a hard time. So, do you want to know when we're going to be doing more talking about more about racial equity? No, that when when you were talking when you were speaking specifically about the like a larger general umbrella motion by the town to attack racial equity and that like was going to be like a what I assumed and I could be assuming incorrectly that was, was maybe like a larger fund that multiple groups would be pulling from yeah well ARPA is a very large fund and and then you know it's like a but so I think what's happening is all of the town departments and and different bodies and boards and committees will be trying to look at things through a more equitable lens to achieve things or to and you know you know like the health report went out and they were having a really hard time with outreach for covid vaccines and so that's a place where they might want to i don't know how to explain it best but because i don't want to put words or make any actions but 
I think it's important that we recognize that we're focused on reparations for residents of African descent. And there's a there's a laser focus that we're having in this particular committee. Um, and there's this larger discussion. And so <clears throat> at what point do we have more of a um, holistic conversation okay. that includes, you know, our group, the safety and social justice group, perhaps the human rights, you know, commission. commission. So, um, because that's where the town is headed overall. And there's all these pots of money and we're all, <laughs> we all wanna get from each of those pots. And there might be this way to really strategically work together to make sure that that larger um, mission is accomplished as well as the individual missions of each group. Irv, did you, your hand is still up. Yeah. I just- yeah, I, 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 I. I, I, I agree with you, Michelle. And, and the thing that um, I've said before is um, we need to have these legal parameters settled for us so we know how we can expend these funds that we know are there. So the question is, all right, do we have to, how do we frame our proposal? Are we framing them in light of, of, of having what we do and the money we, um, we come up with specifically targeted to African-Americans? All right, and, and that has to be decided because there are parameters that we're gonna uh, be, be having to deal with in terms of use of that money for that specific purpose. Are, are, are there ways of accomplishing that specific purpose through other language? Yeah, that's a great, great question. Dr. Jemison, your hands up. Uh, yeah, just um, a quick logistical question. Um, I, so excellent and very thorough report, Irv. Um, one thing that I just wanted to double check, are there any dates we need to be particularly aware of so we can make sure that the committee moves to act by that time. Yes, uh, the same dates that that are there for the budget calendar. Those, if we are going to go after any funds, we're gonna to have to fall into that budget calendar. We may want to add to review the budget calendar or have that, um, you know, for our next agenda to really dig into that and how we're going to approach this. Um, and I believe I sent everyone Sean's report because that has the budget framework in it. Yeah, and it's also in our packet. Yeah, I think it was added. So yes, we should have that. Dr. Shabazz. Yeah, I just want to say in the spirit of, as I heard um, Alyssa Brewer say in one of our previous meetings, that that October report deadline really will position us well if we're making recommendations at that point for some of these time sensitive issues. So if we are looking at by our October check-in report with the council recommending actions be taken around cannabis revenues, uh, um, recommending to the council to do that. If we have an item in there saying we're recommending that uh, surplus uh, or, or free cash continue to flow in our stabilization account, AHRA, in the way that uh, this current amount has flow, flowed in or some percentage, uh, then I think we'll be moving in the right direction to catch a lot of those time sensitive budgetary things if we're looking to make those recommendations by our end of the month report. Irv? Uh, just keep in mind that uh, we are going to be in competition for some of these funds. And the reason for it is that there are uh, additional new, new items that are coming forward on the, uh, 
on the budget scene that weren't there last year. Uh, and, and A, that's A, and B, um, we need to think about and be really um, strategic as in our thinking and putting together these funds so that they continue over time and do not get bumped off by other kinds of uh, necessities that may come up in the future. Um, in other words, I'm talking about sustainability. Just want to acknowledge that we have heard uh, you on sustainable funds and on the uh, October report. Um, I will do one last call for anything on on budget, and then, uh, particularly given that we are at eight minutes to eight, um, <laughs> would like to move on to other topics if we can. Anything else about the budget? Hearing none, Michelle, would you like to give us a legal update? I would. <laughs> All right. So uh, there are a few pieces to this. Um, the first is Dr. Jemison and I will be meeting with Rep. Dom either tomorrow or Friday. Um, so we'll be meeting with her and wanted to ask this group if there were particular questions other than some of the questions that we've already talked about in relationship to the um, legal memo that we received from KP Law. Um, if there are specific questions, I, you know, perhaps they could be sent to us between tonight and tomorrow so that we're not taking up too much time here to talk about them. I'm gonna run through these and then we can come back to questions. Um, Robin Rue Simmons of First Repair has connected us to two uh, people from one from Howard University and one from Columbia that are specifically working on um, the legalities of local reparations. Um, Bill Quist Wilkerson and Linda Mann. Um, and Bill Quist is the managing director of the Thurgood Marshall Civil Rights Center at Howard University. And so we're in the process of setting up a meeting. The question we have for the body here is, um, do we want to invite them to a public meeting? And if so, what would that look like? And then um, I also wanted to let the group know that I had a really informative discussion with community member and retired lawyer, uh, Nita Sorrow. And uh, Nita was so kind to review the report that we received from KP Law and follow up um, with some feedback for the group. Um, and the feedback that um, I received from Anita is first just to acknowledge that this is very complex and that we um, are one of the first municipalities to be doing this. So it's also new and there's not a whole lot of case law that's actually apples to apples when you're looking at it. Um, Anita recommended that we really um, work to determine our objectives and um, continue to work on this process of visioning and what the group has in mind and really wants to pursue. And then building um, coalition with the allies and friends that we have that we know are interested in moving this forward. So like meeting with Rep Dom and um, perhaps making the connection sooner than later with the folks in Cambridge um, and also folks in Boston. I know Boston, King Boston is a coalition group that's been heading up the statewide reparations conversation. And so we have that connection. And then one other item that uh, I talked about with Anita is the um, benefit of defining public purpose. What does public purpose mean? And if special legislation is going to be sought, um, really understanding what that means um, in, with respect to public purpose. So I know that was a lot and, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. At this point, Dr. Jemison and I are gonna be working on this legal piece together. And so um, Dr. Jemison will also be there um, 
to meet initially with Bilquis and Linda from Thurgood Marshall. And then of course we should have discussion about bringing them here. Um, so, yep. And so this is a good time for any questions um, that you may have. Well, I know Anita Saro is, is here as well, and, and we have time and vision perhaps for closing public comments, but um, I would like to drill down a little bit more on the public purpose idea and legislation that could happen at the state level that might clarify or give us here in, at home um, some, some sound ruling authority on which to base um, our, our reparations plan, our, our, our proposed reparations program. The, um, the, uh, the framework that, again, I've, I've looked at, and I know it isn't apples to apples, it may not even be apples to another fruit, it might be apples to, uh, to, to cereal in a box, but, um, but still the question of the Community Preservation Act, did that come up in your, in your legal scan and conversations with, uh, with Rep Dom or anyone in terms of, are we looking at some type of legislative initiative at the state level on that, on the, on the order of the Community Preservation Act that can create the, the home rule legal authority? Uh, and that's, my, that's, that's all to my question. Yeah, and um, Dr. Shabazz, that's top of the agenda. Um, one of the main um, discussion points that we'll have with Rep. Dom, and also um, Rep. Dom has been very supportive in helping us in any way that she can. And so, if we, after this initial discussion, want to invite her to come to to talk more specifically, um, I think that would be really helpful. Are there any other questions or, um, I guess I, I definitely want to make sure that we make a decision because if, if when we speak with Bill Quist and Linda um, from the Thurgood Marshall Center, I want to make sure that we're able to, um, or that we're ready to invite them to come to a public meeting. Um, given that they have very busy schedules and things like that. So I wonder if that's something that we need to vote on or if, if we just can do it. It's my understanding that if there's no objection to something like that, that we can move forward with it without a vote. It's only if there's an objection that then we have to kind of go through the process of a vote. So um, at this point, with respect to inviting Bill Quis and Linda into the um, into the committee for a meeting, um, is there any objection to that? Okay, okay. Irv, yes, please. Question: My the question is, what would be the purpose of this meeting with these two, and what? What do we wish to get out of that meeting? At the, end, at the end of the meeting, what do we hope to walk away with? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, well, you know, I think that given that Robin um, has recommended that these are the folks that are working on this actively, um, we're gonna learn a lot from them and what knowledge they have. I've also provided them with KP Law's um, legal um, recommendations. And so I'm hoping that based on the experience that they have in the work that they're doing, they'll be able to speak to us directly about those recommendations um, and also be able to highlight parts of the recommendations that they may, you know, have information to add to or whatever, whatever the case may be. Um, I think it's more of getting and exploring and getting information from folks that are invested in this and, and doing this work.
I would be really interested in that, especially if they came into a meeting with us ready to talk about their perceptions, reactions, comments, opinions on that KP law. That, that would be particularly valuable. And that's what Dr. Jemison and I will will um, sort of flesh out with them when we meet with them is um, what you know capacity they might join us in. Um, I know that um, Bill Quis provides testimony, from what I can understand, um, it, on the on the bio that I read, um, and really. I think these, based on what I've taken in and understood, these would be really, really um, valuable discussions for us to have. And Dr. Shabazz, I see your hand is up. Yeah, so I, I say definitely without objection. I don't know that uh, it needs to go to a vote. I didn't hear what um, or, uh, Dr. Rhodes raised as an objection. So I think it's without objection. I just would add as well that I give great, trust to both of you co-chairs in um, <laughs> agenda building for, for our discussions. So if from your meeting with Representative Dom, you think there that, you know, and, and, and can schedule time for her to come and, and check in with us, I don't mind appropriating 5, 10, whatever you all would see as the amount of time necessary. Likewise, with uh, these discussions with, um, Linda Mann with uh, also Bill Christ uh, that, um, you know, definitely I give, I give latitude to that there could be value uh, to us. You know, as I say it, and I'll leave with this, the, the legal piece is probably something more relevant for our June report. It's not as actively pressing, if you will, uh, for our October recommendations and our October check-in with the council. I think really our, our sleeves over the next couple of weeks ought to be rolled up around bearing down on, um, you know, whether we're recommending the council move to encumber some of cannabis revenues or encumber free cash or encumber other sources. Um, that I think is going to be really critical to, to press on between now and the October report that we're charged with, with, with uh, um, presenting. Some of these other legal questions, if we can look to calendar those more in November and out from there, I think that that's, that's better. Um, but right now, I think our next couple of meetings to, to uh, before the end of October, we really need to see if there are what, what the financial uh, recommendations are that we want to uh, let the council know and hopefully take action on. You didn't hear me, but I just breathed out a really big sigh of relief. <laughs> I really appreciate that recommendation to focus and um, put our efforts toward the financial questions here. Um, and Irv, I see that you're here. Yeah, right. And I'm, and I'm thinking, yes, I would love to do that but we have to have a purpose for which this money is going to be expended. All right, there has to be a purpose. There has to be some target audience. All right, and that target audience right now is wrapped up in a conundrum, you know, surrounded by some kind of paradox called illegal. And we need to have some legal clarity. We can't recommend something to the council that would have no legal legs to stand on. Quick follow up to that, please. Briefly, yes, please, Dr. Shabazz. Okay. I, I, I respect not trying to take up a whole lot of space, but, uh, but just quickly, the, the beauty of these recommendations in October is that it becomes the, it, it then puts the ball with the council. If they need further deliberation about rationale, about whether the legal underbrush has been cleared up, you know, for them to take action, then, you know, we can work with them. But I don't think we ought to anticipate 
what all their questions are. I think we need to, in the same spirit, mind you, that they committed this 200 plus to a stabilization account that they authorized the town manager to create and that Sean Magano has created. I think it's in that same spirit. We can expect the council to in good faith move within the budget cycle to encumber the resources. Again, vis-a-vis -vis other demands that may be made for equity and inclusion strategies and so on. But on the basis of that we're doing this work, that they can encumber, because here's the rub. If down the road, it would be all determined that, well, none of this could ever be spent in the way desired by this body, the money isn't lost. It's right there in the account. The council can take it and move it back into, into spending on other purposes. So I really don't think we have to be worried about the legality and the eligibility and all of these other kind of rationale questions to make these solid recommendations about the financial instrument uh, and encumbering funds to flow into that in, uh, instrument. And I think that's what ought to be our major debates and conversations around over the next two weeks leading into October. These other questions of rationale, I think right now we can step out on faith that our council is with us and could move to encumber funds uh, and, and make decisions around funds now, expecting that by June, we will have greater clarity about the mechanisms for spending those funnies, funding. Thank you. There's no argument that I have with you. What I'm saying to you is that, yes, that, those funds are going to be put into that account come November. That is not a question. They will be put into that stabilization fund for our purposes, because that, had already, that has already been voted on by the town council. So I wanna make sure that's understood. I am not talking about that. I am talking about the expenditures of such funds or any other funds that we have, how that will occur if, if we do not have really legal clarity. So there's two issues. One is non-issue because it's already been voted on. The money's going into that account, the stabilization account. That's, that's going to happen. The other uh, question is, what are we going to expend those funds on in the immediate future? When I say immediate future for, for the upcoming budget cycle or other funds that we can identify to be expended, what are we going to expend those funds on? But in surrounding all of that are the legal questions. So legal legal questions have nothing to do with those fund, the funds in the stabilization fund. Zero. They're going in. It's going to happen in November. Thank you, uh, Irv. Um, so I'm just going to bring aware, awareness to a couple of things right now. Um, this is the impasse we hit at our, at our last conversation. And I think as it gets late, we might be talking past each other a little bit. Um, there is clear urgency to make sure that funds are secured that is dictated by the budget calendar. And I appreciate Dr. Shabazz's encouragement that in the next very near term meetings, we handle those questions to make sure that we can secure funds, not only money that already went into the stabilization fund or is imminently going into the stabilization fund, but from those other sources. Um, so can I, are there, are there any other comments on this one or because we've got two topics we haven't covered yet and an open comment period to get through on what everyone already agreed was a long day, so. Dr. Jemison, the only thing I would say is, um, do we want to, between now and our next meeting, assign each of those funding sources, like one to each of us, 
um, and have that person dig in and then come back and report to the group what they found. So we've identified several different sources that I've heard um, throughout this meeting. And so maybe we just want to divvy them out and say, hey, you go find out everything you can about that particular source of funding and bring it back to the next meeting. I am, I personally am for that proposal. Um, I just, although I do want to ask if it would be an undue burden on, is it Sean who would be answering all these questions? Does he want to hear from seven of us or it doesn't matter? Um, I know he's not here, but. I think we'll probably be, end up going to the individual committee heads who like, okay. or, you know, and, and, and there might be some cases where we have to ask Sean or check in with town manager Bockelman, but I think we'll be able to get a lot from the committee heads. Um, for that, I think that would be a really useful way for us to really be able to come back next time because I'm not sure that all of us understand each of these funding sources and how they work and what the process is um, for utilizing them. Uh, yes, uh, there's Irv and then Dr. Shabazz and just I, I didn't, I brought that up just so that we have something to move toward for the next meeting. And um, also very aware of what Dr. Jemison said that it is late and um, we still have a couple additional items to get through. So maybe we can just make uh, these couple comments quick and then move forward. Go ahead, Herb. All right, so great suggestion. Uh, but, you know, but I, I think that, um, you know, um, practicality is going to have to rule here. Uh, we, we, we need to move in an expeditious manner. We need to have, if there's any additional information that is needed on these funds, I'm definitely willing able to bring all of that back to you. Uh, Sean is overwhelmed. He's a new father, a very new father. Uh, and so uh, therefore, you know, having other people, because this one, he's the source. Sean is the source. Uh, and every and, and whatever money that we're going to request has to be requested through a, the budget process. And then, and, and, and then that, that budget process is a discrete process that is known that goes through the council, through, through the council. But first we have to decide what money do we want and how much do we want and what it's going to be used for? If we can't answer that last question in some, in some kind of way, what is going to be used for? Because the council is certainly going to ask it. Uh, then we were going to be losing, I mean, use, using up a lot of time going nowhere. Because that last question, what are we going to use it for, is the important question. And I think, Irv, it's just, I think it's important because you have a lot of knowledge about this, but we don't all and the public doesn't all. So I'm simply suggesting that we are getting a brief overview. Like you might know what CPAC is and what, um, you know, all of these other items that were mentioned that my brain is not able to come up with right now. Um, but not everybody in the group knows exactly what those funding sources are and what they, you know, look like. And so that's where that suggestion came from. Um, Dr. Spaz. Thank you. In the spirit of, of both your comments, I'd like to move it forward with by first volunteering for one of them. I will reach out to CPAC. I will reach out with a specific proposal that I have in mind that could perhaps come out of that supplemental funding that I will then bring back to this body to, to look at, uh, that, I, that I think this body can both endorse and that I think CPAC, it would fall under the, their Community Preservation Act, particularly the history component of it. So I will be glad to take CPAC. I think I understand the point now of IRV is not so much about um, the funding like the stabilization funding that's going into an endowment. He's asking about within the current budget cycle, how might we be requesting in the name of, of, of um, 
reparative justice for African heritage people, what are specific ideas and projects under some of these. So I don't know who might take community development block grant within this body. Um, I would nominate Michelle maybe to look at cannabis revenue and make coming back with a specific revenue because I know um, she and, and, and the group she founded were looking at that, have been looking at that idea over the last two years or a year and a half. So I think they could probably, I think she could probably bear down on any specific recommendations we might want to make out of the cannabis revenue, which to me saying put encumbered this amount of the cannabis revenues for this coming fiscal year and put it in our stabilization fund. That's that, that we're growing in endowment. That is the rationale. There's no more specifics. I think for that one is necessary. It's to grow our endow, endowed fund that our June report will, will point toward a mechanism and potential ideas and work out the legality of. So I think that might be sufficient for cannabis. I don't know about ARPA funds, uh, what would qualify in this cycle or who best to take that up. I don't know about community development block grant. I don't know about CARES Act or, or COVID relief money, um, but I will take on CPAC. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shabazz. Can I also ask if you were planning to go to a, comp a, a council with a proposal as a representative of this committee, could you maybe tell us what it is? No, I, I'm bringing it back to this committee. I'll, I'll find out the CPAC information and that I'll bring both that and the specific uh, uh, recommendation. And I could even send it beforehand. The recommendation is basically for an African-American heritage uh, marker program where we would mark historical sites in the town of Amherst with a marker program. Uh, it will require money to build the markers. It will require money yes. to, uh, okay. uh, to have those planted. So that's the budget piece of it that I think could come out of CPAC uh, developmental, but that's just a thumbnail. Great. Right. If you have that yeah. in writing, it would be really wonderful if you could provide that for us, even just a sketch so it can go in the packet. It's, it's always wonderful to have full information so everyone can have a considered opinion. Uh, Shabazz, your answer that you're going to get from CPAC is yes, you can do that. 100% yes. That was one of the things that came up in yesterday's meeting. Yes, you will be able to do that for memorials, monuments, etc. Great. And just to follow up with what Dr. Jemison just said, um, Irv, if it's possible to put what you um, propose to Sean in writing and the answers in writing, so they may be included, although I guess they'll be in the minutes of the meeting. So maybe that's not even necessary, but I do want to make sure that all of that information that you provided to us tonight is captured um, and I can do the same thing Although again, like I said, it's probably going to be in the meeting minutes. <laughs> so. uh, yeah, I, I, I can do that. I've, I've only stopped the video because I'm sick of looking at myself. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, um, Dr. Jemison, do you want to move us uh, on <laughs> to the next? Yeah, I, I regret that we we skipped um, what I thought might be a, a quick item. Um, which we were going to hear a little bit more information uh, from Jennifer about um, us having a, an email dedicated to this or a communication dedicated to this, uh, this group. I will have to follow up next weekend. Not next weekend, but at our next meeting. I just honestly didn't have the time to check in with Paul. And sometimes, even though we're on the same floor, it's like ships passing. So... Again, only one working day, so we, we totally get that. No worries. Thank you. We will table that for the next mm -hmm. one. Um, and then, so I think our last uh, item for this week was um, some visioning. And again, <laughs> recollecting that we only had one bus business day for this. Um, Dr. Shabazz, did you? Oh, go ahead. I'm so sorry. Did somebody take on CDBG and did somebody or? Not or yet. I mean, can we assign yet? those? Okay. Off, those things are just floating. Well, no, can we assign them post meeting? Meeting? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think Dr. Jemison and I can get together to start to, to, to develop the next meeting's agenda and we'll quickly kind of try to assign those post meetings so that we're not caught up in that right now. And uh -huh. if somebody wants to take one on, please email us and say, this is the one I'd like to take on or something along that line. So, I mean, it's, it's fine, but we seem to have lost Hala. So I don't know if she's dropped accidentally or had a time constraint. Um, just acknowledging that she's not able to be here for, but we still have a quorum, so <laughs> away we go. Um, so yes, our last item uh, was visioning. Um, and Dr. Shabazz, do you have an update on that this week or is, yeah. Yeah, I think we can uh, more um, hold on that for now. I, I think that the, um, I hear you loud and clear on, uh, putting some specifics in the packet before our meeting ahead ahead of time. So um, I will go with that with follow follow that recommendation. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so that ends the items we put on the sort of formal plan part of the agenda. Uh, do we go now to the public the second co public comment, Michelle, or did we want to get clear the other topics or the other standing topics? Um, I think we could do, we could call for public comment right now. Um, and then we can, you know, we basically can, I think, just say if there are no member reports, we just move beyond that. There probably aren't, but maybe there are. Um, and then really just coming up with a next meeting date um, and other topics that the chair did not reasonably anticipate, which I don't have any. So let's, yeah, let's open it up for public comment at this point. Um, so if there is anybody here that would like to speak, and we do actually have one here, um, Anita would like to join um, for public comment. So Anita, you have up to three minutes and we will listen and take notes. Sure. And I will try to be even quicker. Um, I, I just wanted to clarify uh, one thing on, on the legal discussion. And that is that um, a, a lot of what dr drives a legal opinion in this context is not really the words on the page. You know, this is a, uh, about sections of Massachusetts law and Massachusetts constitution that has then been interpreted over the past 150 years through different cases that brought very specific facts and circumstances for a court to consider. So instead, uh, I, in, in situations like this, I would just urge, urge everyone to, to have some clear expectation of what a legal opinion could do because it's not the legal opinion that is going to make it easier for you to vision what you would like to do, it kind of works in reverse. The legal opinion is by and large based on what goals, what objectives this group has in mind. What does reparations look like for you? Because the KP law opinion there's an implication that they were interpreting reparations in the narrowest sense possible, which was individual grants. And exactly. So I, I think, you know, the visioning is going to be extremely important. Partnering or seeking out allies who are doing this work in Massachusetts, like Cambridge, if Cambridge feels like they are going to be able to use town funds for specific things, and they've gotten clearance from their lawyer, that would be interesting to see. So uh, all I'm saying is don't wait for the definitive legal opinion do your visioning, set your goals, draw the picture that you want for the town and make the argument that there is public benefit here, that we all will be benefited. If it comes to, for instance, awards to allow a small business that uh, will be owned by an African-American. How does that relate to public benefit? Well, it creates more for the tax base. It makes the town vibrant. You know, kind of pulling out those, thinking in that way. 
Uh, but certainly thinking first about what you would like to see and then looking at the legal context within that framework. So if I could just wave a magic wand and say, don't worry about it for now. Um, open up your mind to possibilities and have at it. That's it. <laughs> Thank you, Anita. <laughs> Is there anyone else? I see we only have um, Council Brewer here. So um, if there are no other public comments, then I think we can move on um, and determine uh, our next meeting date. <clears throat> That's always fun. <laughs> um, and are you still meeting as a community safety working group Jen, next week? Are they still going to be meeting next Thursday? I'm not 100% sure that they're meeting next Thursday, the 21st. I'm thinking they're meeting on the 28th as their last meeting, but okay. I, I would feel uncomfortable like booking that day if we could just wait the two more weeks and then we could go full scale to Thursdays. I would, would feel better. I just... And also, like, you can't have two Zoom meetings going on off of my one account, so somebody's <laughs> getting kicked out. <clears throat> so was this time okay for folks if we did next Wednesday, 6.15? Uh, so I have Human Rights Commission on the 20th. Okay. Also, she's going to need time for open meeting law to, to publish this meeting. So it can't be any sooner than one week out, right? Or, or is it 48 hours? You it's need? 48 hours that I need, but you know, I could have Angela come back and attend this meeting and I could cover the HRC if this is the only date that works. Like, I don't want, like, I'm not gonna hold everybody up. So if this is the only day that really works next week, then we'll make that happen. Tuesdays are pretty good, I don't know. <laughs> Oh, but Hala, but Hala has school committee. Yeah. Committee. Irv, Dr. Shabazz, Alexis, Dr. Jemison. <laughs> Is I know you're traveling, right, Alexis? So you right. Okay. Yeah, I was just gonna default to everybody else. I, yeah, I have the evening free Tuesday through Friday. So okay. Dr. Shabazz is Wednesday night. Is that okay? And Irv, are you available on Wednesday night? Is that the 20th? Yes. Yes, I am. Okay. Sorry, Jennifer, for this weekend. Hopefully, moving forward, we'll be able to stick on. No, no um, problem. But that, that's good because we don't want to miss Hal on Tuesday night. So let's set it for Wednesday, 6.15. Um, and Dr. Jemison and I will work on the agenda and trying to get items into the packet. Um, and so I think then that moves us. Um, are there any member reports? <laughs> We've reported enough um, and upcoming events. Anything, Jennifer, relevant in terms of upcoming events that we need to <laughs> announce? No, usually I, I've always got something up my sleeve, but I, I, I don't have anything today. No, unfortunate. Right. Great. And um, Dr. Jemison, did you have any other topics that you didn't reasonably anticipate? reasonably anticipate my words aren't even working anymore yeah. all right yeah not this evening <laughs> oh dr shabazz well i just would note that uh at the uh, university of massachusetts tomorrow at 12 noon the uh, umass uh branch of the national association for the advancement of colored people has called a uh, gathering of uh to be revolutionary in the face of uh the different challenges we have with with racial and sexual harassment on campus. So they're doing that at 12 noon at the student union uh, on the campus. Thank you. So I guess we can move to adjourn the meeting. Is that, does that sound good to everyone? Second. Sounds really good. <laughs> All right, well then.
at night. <laughs> what, what was that, Herb? I want to have an avatar for my next meeting. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, I can just do have, it. <laughs> can you just tell me the time that you're journeying at? Are we calling that 8.30? It's 8.30? Let's yeah. call it 8.30. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, thank everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Good night, Bye. all.